Would you grab hold of a Bible and make your way to 1 Timothy chapter 2? If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles around you. Chairs nearby, you can grab one. Page number on the screen. We want you to be there with us as we are just continuing a study that we're doing in 1 Timothy. We're making our way verse by verse through this book, longing that God would speak into our lives the things that He has for us. But we've even titled the whole series that it's really 1 Timothy, a blueprint, God's design for the church. And I want to just tell you, as we gaze into this book, what we're longing is that God would form us as individuals, but He would form us also as a church to the plan and pattern that He has for our lives. Certainly, that's the key for us to understand and long that God would form us into that. And so with that as a name, let's take a moment and pray for it. Let's ask that God would just take our lives and shape us this morning, that He would give us openness to that. I'm going to pray for that for me, but I'm inviting you to pray for that for you, that you would ask that God would speak to you through His Word this morning. Will you join me? Father, I thank You that Your Word is true. I thank You that in the midst of a broken world, You have a plan a plan for how it's going to be handled and how that should move. And I I thank you that you've unpacked that plan for us in the Bible, that through your word you show us how to live. You show us what you are, what you intend. You show us what we're to be as a church. And Lord, as I think about that in 1 Timothy, I thank you for it. But I ask you to draw us to it, that you'd shape our lives by your design that you would give us a sensitivity to that and even responsiveness to that. That, Lord, right now you would work in such a way that what you're wanting to say to us, we would hear. What you're wanting to work in us would be accomplished. Soften our hearts, draw us to that. I ask for everyone here this morning for that, but I ask for it in me as well. Lord, work in my heart. Make me to hear your voice, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I could sum up the entire message this morning in three words. Now, it's going to be more than three words, so don't get excited. (laughs) But it could still be summed up in three words this morning. Real men pray. Hey, yeah, that's exactly what I want to tell you God's design is. In fact, notice with me how it begins there in verse 8 says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. He says, here's what I desire. God's like, he says, I want men to pray. And we want to talk about what that looks like. Well, before we get there, though, let's catch it in context, because there is a context. You might even notice there what we just read. I desire, therefore. Therefore always points back to something else. It connects to what we've been talking about before. And if you've been with us over the last three weeks, We've been talking about God's design for His church that we be a praying people. We saw at the beginning of the chapter where it just said, you know, that God's desire was first of all that we pray with supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks. That He told us that we are meant to be a people that pray. And then He told us how effective that could be. That we're to pray for nations, we're to pray for kings, because it literally can change the fabric of the world around us that it can shape both our world but our lives, bringing our lives into quiet, peaceable lives with godliness and dignity, that our prayers can change the very fabric of that. But the intention of that change is not some selfish ambition. It's about the gospel. It's about seeing God's kingdom move forward in our world. It's about seeing people saved. And it's about what that looks like. And so this place of prayer is inviting us to be a people that are engaged in the big work that God is doing in the world. That is saving lives, and that our prayers would be a part of that. And he's told us that in that sense, we are to be a praying people. Well, with that before us, he now begins to apply it very specifically. And he's going to invite us to understand God's design for men to pray and for women to pray. And that's really how we're going to cover that. This morning, we're going to talk about men of prayer, and next week, we're going to talk about women of prayer. And I want to just help you to understand that because the aim is that specific. It says there in our verse, I desire that men pray. And the word that is used here for men, it's very specific. Sometimes the word man or men can speak of all mankind. You guys know how that works. And so sometimes you say, hey, we're talking to mankind and we mean men and women. Other times it's very specifically masculine. This one is very specifically masculine. That he's saying, I desire that men pray. 
So here's what we need to understand. Let's just begin this way. Hey, ladies, this morning, this message is for men, so you're off the hook. Like, you can just, you can just kind of tune out now. I'm just kidding. You know better than that. Um, there's nothing we're going to say this morning that doesn't also apply to you. There's nothing in this that isn't like, well, I'm glad that men have to. I mean, no, it all works. And so it may be as we talk about these things, even though the aim and the target is for men to hear it, it may be in the midst of the Holy Spirit's going to apply some things to specifically to you. I want you to hear that Holy Spirit speak that. It may also be that God's just going to invite you to be someone that makes sure this is the, the influence you have. You have influence in the lives of men. And, and you want to be this kind of influence that encourages them in what God has made them to be. So ladies, hey, again, don't tune out. I mean, this is God's going to speak, I hope, through this. But again, it's aimed at men. So I'm going to speak specifically to men. So men, I want you to hear it that way. I want you to hear it this morning that this is a message that God's pattern and design for men is to be this way. And I want you to hear that. And yet I say that in a way that I'm already nervous having said it. Because I know how this works. I mean, when we realize that God is like highlighting us, like poignantly and personally, it can actually put us on the defensive. And we're like, okay, well, you know, like, I just want to encourage you not to be there. I want to encourage you to hear from God this morning that what God's desire is for you is to hear his plan for you in prayer. So let's read the whole verse. Picking it up again, verse eight. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, or without doubting. God's aim, God's desire is he says, I want men to pray. God's plan in the midst of this is God's work in this is that God has longed for that we as men be that. And I need you to hear that this morning. In fact, I want you to hear it in the tone that it is given. He begins it with this idea of saying, I desire. And it's a fascinating thing that Paul does. He does it right here in this verse. He does it throughout the chapter. He did it in the last chapter. That in one sense, we read Timothy, and it's a personal letter. It's a letter from Paul to Timothy. And so it expresses itself in a very personal way. That said, it's authoritative. This is the word of God. This isn't like something that is just Paul's personal wishes it's God's wishes. And it's not just God speaking to, to Timothy, he's certainly speaking to us. And I need you to understand that what he's saying to us here, it is authoritative. This is God speaking. He's the one that's saying it. In fact, I want you to hear it that way. It would be as if God's saying, I desire this for you. Now, what makes that kind of fun is it really has an encouraging tone to it. Uh, to come and say, I desire, I mean, it's a command because what God, <laughs> what God desires is a command. Like, I mean, that's like, that's, that's, but he says it in such a way that it's meant to be an encouragement. He's been doing this throughout Timothy for you guys who've been with us, so I hope you can kind of feel it, that it's as if Paul is coming alongside Timothy and just saying, man, I want you to be everything that God has for you to be. I want the church to be everything that God has it to be. And he does so in a way that isn't coming across with a con condemning tone, but an encouraging tone. I want you to hear it that way this morning. If you hear my voice and it sounds condemning, specifically men this morning, I want to tell you that's not the tone that I'm trying to give. It's not a tone that's going to beat us up or, you know, just make us feel bad. It is meant to be an encouraging, I desire this for you. I want this for you. I, I long for this to be there. I hope you would hear that tone. You would hear this place where you'd say, I desire this. I, I want that to be there. So that begins our qualification, but then also notice how extensive. He says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. Everywhere? Yeah, everywhere. The idea is not that we are praying in every location, though there is some truth to that. The idea is that it's for the church everywhere. That in other words, 1 Timothy is a blueprint, and we've talked a little bit about this, that God is showing us what he intends the church to be. Like, what does it look like to be a church in any generation? He says this is what he longs for. That he's telling us that all churches, or we could say it very specifically, for Roswell, for, for Calvary Roswell, God's desire for the men in this church is to be men of prayer. Or if I can say it even more personally to you right now, it's God's aim and desire for you. There's not a man in here that God is looking and saying, well, not you. 
I was talking to other guys. I really wasn't speaking to you. Like, you're the exception to the rule. Like, this isn't, doesn't really work for you. And I just want you to say that's not the way this is. He's specifically saying, hey, this isn't just a local thing. This isn't what, what something that was just for the church there in Ephesus where Timothy was. He says, this is my desire for men everywhere. Men in all locations, men in every city, men in every church. Like, this is who you are made. This is what God wants you to be. He's longing. He's telling us, hey, my desire for you is that men would pray, that men would be men of prayer. Let's explore that just for a moment. This encouragement that's coming, this challenge, this aim that God is giving us, if you're going to hear this rightly and respond to it, we need to overcome a couple of things. For starters, you need to overcome the lies that Satan has infused into this world. He understands this better than you have any understa- belief of. He knows this, and so he's worked it in such a way that for some, they really begin to think about prayer, and they kind of think, well, you know, prayer's a women's work. I mean, that's like, that's like women do that. Now, don't miss this. Women, you should. That's next week. Women are meant to be women of prayer. That is 100% there. There's no sense of, of degrading that. But having said that, we kind of live in this culture that it's almost highlighted as if that's what women do. I mean, like women, they pray. I mean, that's what, as if somehow men didn't. I mean, sometimes even in the Christian culture, we have it that way. So you'll hear things like, boy, if you have a praying mom or a praying grandmother, you are in serious trouble. You know, like your mom or your grandmother going to pray you. I mean, that, and, and there's some truth to that. Women, you should be that. But it should also be if you have a, a praying dad, if you have a praying grandfather, that should be something you should be like, that, that changes the world. Because men are meant to pray. Men are meant to pray. And yet there is such this lie that's infused in this culture where you almost have this idea that men would almost see it as an unmanly thing. I mean, you'll see it like in a movie or a show, right? I mean, you'll have some, you know, you know, cowboys like, you know, I'm not much of a praying man. And it almost makes it sound like, well, that's like, you know, full of esteem. It's like, that is not a good thing. <laughs> like, like you just, I mean, from a biblical model, you just said, I'm not really much of a man. You know, it's just like, because I don't, I don't do what men are supposed to do. Men are made to be men of prayer. And, you, and if you're going to hear this, you're going to have to recognize there's a lie that is seeking to rob you from being that. Uh, to rob you from that, you're going to have to overcome that lie. In fact, to overcome that lie, there's a sense of just understanding that there's a war that's taking place. That God would picture this picture of prayer and who we are. That God would call us as men to step into it as a spiritual battle. I think about it this way. In Psalm 144, David writes, and he says, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. It's this great picture. David is like, you know, God has made me and he's trained me for this. And there's a, there was a natural thing. David really was a king and a leader and there were some things there. But we were talking in, a, in our office a couple weeks ago when we were reading through this together as a church. And we were talking about how much more this picture is who we are spiritually. That God has made you, I mean, as a man. For the men here, God, God would like to train your fingers for battle. He'd like to train you to step into a spiritual war. That's how God describes it. He would say it in 2 Corinthians this way. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down strongholds. Like we're involved in a battle. It's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual war. So that we are meant to be that. And we actually, again, use that in our, in our terms, right? We'll talk about people who really pray. And we'll call them prayer warriors. It's a good term. Because it is a battle. In fact, I think about it this way. In Ephesians 6, he would picture it. And, and Paul is talking about the battle we're in. And he would say it this way. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And in just this huge overarching picture, he says, you know, our battle, it's not this physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. And it's a battle that we are engaged in with principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. I mean, there really is a spiritual war. It's a very real battle. And he tells us we can stand. He tells us there in Ephesians 6 that therefore take up the whole armor of God. 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. And then he goes through and he pictures the provisions that are given to us as Christ as armor. So I want you to kind of picture it. In your mind, I just want you to think about it. He's like, you need to take up what God has given you because you're in a war. I mean, put on the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, you know, get your helmet of salvation, your sword of the spirit. You know, I mean, like you just need to be geared up for a battle because this is a battle. So I want you to picture that. I want you to picture this guy, this, this soldier kind of, you know, geared up there. And then he tells us now that you're clothed for battle. He says, you need to be one who prays with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. That's the battle. I mean, if you can picture it this way, if we only got the armor on and didn't step into the battle, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's pointless. I mean, yeah, you can stand against what Satan would do against you, but he's saying, you put on the battle, put on the armor, and then get into the fight. How do you get it? Pray with all prayer and supplication. Like, this is our battle. This is the battle. And it is fought in prayer. And this is where you need to go. And he's challenging us to be that, to step into the battle that's there in front of us. Which, by the way, the next verse says, Paul says, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make the, known the mystery of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. It's a little bit of a bonus thought. If you were here last week, this is what we talked about. In fact, we quoted this verse. And we talked about how that evangelism really is connected to prayer. That prayer is powerful in seeing God's work go forward in, in the gospel. That we should be praying for open doors and boldness and powerful words. And that the real power of the gospel going forward really is connected to us praying. That we would be a people of prayer. Imagine it this way. Mary, Queen of Scots, once said, I I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. I mean, here she is. She's the leader there, kind kind of fighting against the Protestant Reformation, fighting against the church in many ways, and yet she says, I'm afraid of that man's prayers. I'm afraid of that man and his prayers. I mean, would to God that we would see it this way, that there is a sense of just understanding that there's a battle that's being fought, that's meant to be fought, and men, you're made for it. You're made for it. You're made to be a part of this battle. And I want to say it as clearly and loudly as I can. Hey, that's what you're supposed to be doing. You're meant to be in this and to where you're not doing that. You're like a soldier who won't take up his arms to fight. You're like a soldier that fails to step into the battle that's right in front of you. Now, let me say that a little bit more carefully. I am in no way making any kind of side comments. There is kind of a whole, you know, wrestling that some have and some find themselves as pacifists, that meaning that in our present day warfares, there are some out of good conscience, they don't feel like they can do that. And there are some believers that are there. And I just, I just want to make it very, very clear. I'm not making fun of that. I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, if that's you or anybody else, please don't. We're not even talking about that. We're talking spiritually. But I'm talking spiritually. There is absolutely no place for us to be in such a pacifistic place, some place where we are made for it and we won't fight in it. If you are a man who is not a man of prayer, you're a soldier who won't take up your weapons to fight. Think about it this week. I mean, this week, for many of you, you're going to think through Pearl Harbor. It's a time that you imagine that the, the things that took place in our nation, and for some of you, it's well known, it's, it's there in your, your mind. Could you imagine what it would be like to look at a soldier who may be was set on the, the edge of that and was supposed to be, you know, seeing what was coming or, or, or to fight in that. Or maybe who was supposed to be there once that happened. And then they found themselves going, eh. You know, it's like, hey, you should be standing. It's like, oh, I just thought I would play solitaire. You know, I got to play basketball. You know, it's not really into the whole prayer thing. You know, it's not really my, my, my deal. And, uh, you know, I just don't, if you were to look at that, if I could say it somewhat more clearly than I'm saying it right now, it would appear as the horrible thing that it is. It would be near treason. It's like, you're supposed to stand in the gap. Like, what are you doing? People are dying. Men and women are going down. There's, and, and you won't pray? Like, really? I mean, you're a soldier who's meant to stand in the gap. What are you? I mean, that you're a man. Like, that is what a man is. A man is meant to be one who prays. Men, by God's design, in the church of Jesus Christ, are meant to be a man of prayer. That being that, being a real man, is what God designed us to be, and that finds itself expressed 
in this place of prayer, and I just need you to believe it. I just need you to hear it, that this is God's intention for you as a man. I find myself thinking in 2 Samuel, in the King James Version, there in chapter 10, Joab is facing a battle, and, and, he and they, they, they're caught on both sides, and so he splits up the forces of Israel to take the battle, and he just then speaks this to him. He says, be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God, and let the Lord do with that which seemeth good to him. I mean, he's just there, and he looks up at them and says, men be men. Let's, let's play the man like we're supposed to stand in this, and let God do what he's going to do, but let it find us in this battle that we're there, that we are going to be men in the midst of this. And that picture is exactly what I'm trying to say. In fact, it is interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in the King James Version again, it says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. Be strong. I mean, it's this great little term, like, like, quit you like men. And, you know, again, it doesn't really work in our modern English because we're like, what do you mean quit? That sounds bad. Sound, <laughs> kind of sounds like you're quitting. No, it has the idea of, of stand in it. Like, be a man. And, like, be men in this whole thing. In a modern translation, the New King James, it would say, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. It's not a bad translation. I mean, really, in many ways, that's kind of how it was understood, the idea of being brave was that idea. But the fun thing is in the, in the Greek language, it really does mean be a man, like be men, like be manly. I mean, like you should be like what you are. I mean, he just looks at us and says, here's what I want. Watch, stand fast in the faith. You should be brave. Like you, sh- you should be there. And I want to tell you, everything inside me just wants to tell you that men, that's exactly what God is saying. William Merrill wrote a hymn that some of you would recognize, just rise up, O men of God, and and it's a great hymn, and I I like all of it, but the first verse of it is one of my favorites, where it just says, you know, rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things, give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the king of kings. He says, you know, men rise up, (laughs) just like you should rise up, O men of God, and I'm just telling you what I'm trying to say this morning is saying the same thing, like men, let's have done with lesser things. I mean, let's, I mean, things that would hold us back from being what we're meant to be. And I'm just telling you, with everything that I can say inside me, that God's design is for you to pry. There's just not anybody in this room. There's not a man in this room that that's not what God wants for you. There's not a woman in this room that God doesn't want that for you. And we'll talk more about that next week. But please hear me now. It's meant to be encouraging. It's meant to be challenging. It's meant to tell you, like, this is who you are meant to to be. That God would look upon you and he says, here's what I desire for men everywhere. You should be praying men. I hope that would be who you are. Well, let's talk about that. We think about this whole thing. It's this encouragement that I'm trying to speak it, and I hope you are hearing it. I hope there's a challenge in the midst of it. But as he gives us this challenge, he then gives us three things that are needed for men to pray. Three things that are specifically being addressed as if hey, these are things that we need to make sure we have in our lives to be men of prayer. Now, before we talk about those, let's go on a little bit of a rabbit trail. We travel on a rabbit trail, we won't go long on it, but let's go back to the verse just for a second. It says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, and then notice, lifting up holy hands. Let's talk just on this rabbit trail for a moment about the posture of prayer. Like, what's the right posture of prayer? I don't know if you know it, but I mean, it's so much a part of our culture that, you know, for us, we think, you know, head down, eyes closed, hands grasped. I mean, like, that's almost universally understood in our world today, like, you're praying. Like, that's what you, okay, prayer is head down, eyes closed, hands clasped, that's prayer. Funny thing, we never never have that posture of prayer ever exampled for us anywhere in Scripture. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing, doesn't mean it's the wrong way to do it, but please understand, it actually isn't given to us. It isn't like, hey, that's what prayer looks like. No, the most common posture of prayer is hands up, head up, looking up to the heavens. I mean, that's the most common posture of prayer found anywhere in the scripture, and it is to that analogy that he's saying, hey, men should be lifting up holy hands. Again, it is a picture. Now, it's, that's not the only way to pray. We'd find all over. We'd find at times that people would be sitting in prayer. 
We'd find other times that people would be standing, other times walking as they pray. We'd find some that would be bowing as they pray, some who would find themselves kneeling and even prostrate in prayer. What I want you to hear is there is not a single, like, hey, this is the right way to pray found anywhere in Scripture. In fact, we find it in all kinds of diverse places. In fact, I think through that, you should find both encouragement to discover and freedom to live what that would look like. Again, just telling you, hey, whatever works for you is you're going to engage in prayer for maybe it really is walking. Like I could, when I take a walk and God and I, we can have a, just a deep talk. It's great. Then do that. Some of you, it's driving. You know, hey, I get in the car, nobody else in the car, and I can just talk out loud to God, and it's a great place for me. Some of you, it really is. Hey, you know what? When I close my eyes and bow my head, it's just like the world shuts out. Hey, you can do that. But you might experiment as well, because sometimes you'll find, like, I just feel weak in it. It might even just be fun. Like, nobody has to know. Like, go in your bedroom, close the door, and, and just try. Lifting up your hands to God and, sk- and, and eyes open, just talk to Him. Just, 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 just speak to Him. Again, there are postures in prayer, and yet there's not a perfect one, and so that's our rabbit trail. Let's leave the rabbit trail. Let's go back and, and talk about where we are. So, men, you are meant to be men of prayer. And he gives us three things that specifically apply to men. Now, all these three things apply to women here as well. So please understand, there's not like, hey, this doesn't work for you. But somehow men need to hear it in a special way. What things would hinder us from being men of prayer? Well, they're found specifically here. He begins and says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. We need holiness. To be men who, who pray powerfully are men who are living holy lives. It's a simple understanding, but unforgiven sin hinders prayer. With, that when sin is present in our lives and we are not turning or having that dealt with, it hinders us from being powerful in prayer. We need the picture of it, the Bible would use over and over, is we need clean hands. We need to be able to go before God with that so that we can find our prayer being powerful. Psalm 66 gives it to us this way. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. He says, if I'm holding on to sin and I'm valuing it and I won't let go of it, he says, then my prayers just got cut off because I'm holding on to that. That, I, that if I do that, if sin is there and it's there, that place, it makes my prayers just locked down, that it's not working because sin is hindering that. Isaiah would say it the same way, this way. God speaks to him. He says, when you spread out your hands, and that's the idea of prayer, like you're spreading out your hands, God says, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. He says, you're not holding up holy hands, you're holding up bloody hands. You're holding up hands that are marked by, by your sin and your rebellion, and he says, that's not going to be effective. You're going to have to deal with that. David would say it in a positive way. He says, who could ascend in the hill of the Lord? Who could stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Like, who can go before God? Who can enter into God's presence and, and find that to be a powerful place? You've got to have clean hands. You've got to have clean hands got to have a pure heart because that's the only way this is going to work. And that's what's given to us in Christ. In 1 John chapter 1 there in verse 7, it says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. I mean, such an amazing reality. Can I just highlight here, this is what makes this so wonderful. Like Jesus came, he died on the cross for us, so that if you come into a relationship with Jesus, that his blood pays the price for your sin, it can cleanse us. It can cause us to be clean, and in one sense, we are. That said, we still need to deal with our sin practically. Two verses later, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Like if we come and deal with our sin with him, he can clean us. Hear me as clear as I can, men, ladies as well. You might find yourself thinking, well, this is why I can never pray because I'm just not a perfect person. There is not a perfect person in this room. If, If that was what we needed, we'd never get there. But Jesus died for us to open up the place. But what is needed is for us to deal with our sin. What is needed is that we deal with that. And as we deal with that, as we deal presently and actively with our sin, 
it then opens up the door for us. It, it draws us into a place. That's needed for all of us. There's a place of just understanding that if we're going to be serious about prayer and we want to be effective in prayer, then holiness is what we need to pursue. Holiness is what we need to have, have a part of. See, I think I might be talking to somebody right now and, and you're in that place that prayer is not a big deal in your life, partly because you have not found it really that powerful. Like you've tried, like, and, you, and you've kind of concluded, maybe I'm just not much of a praying person. Maybe my prayers don't really work. And it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you won't deal with your sin. You won't turn away from your sin. And, and you think that somehow your prayers should work, though you don't move into it and say, God, cleanse me. I just want to tell you, this is a constant need. That if we're going to enter into God's presence, for you guys who understand the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, I mean, there was this labor, and every time, every time you, you, you entered in, you had to be clean. Every time. It was like, stop again. Like, okay, because God, I want to be in your presence. You know, I mean, I, I want to, there's no way for me to do that without dealing with my sin. Now, all of us need that. But let's ask a different question, or ask it in a different way. Why do men need to hear this specifically? Hey, men, men you, you just answer this in your own life. Like, why do you and I specifically need to understand this? Well, maybe sometimes it's because we disregard it, and maybe it's a weakness that becomes, the way that God made us can sometimes make this hard. God has designed men, men and women differently, and there's a, there's a tenacity that he's made to be in men, a focus, a, a pursuit that makes us who we are, that sometimes can have a weakness that men can disregard and almost not notice. Can I say it a different way? I'm definitely not an expert, but I am married, and I have three daughters. And I want to tell you, my experience has taught me that for the most part, women are a little bit more emotionally aware than most men. You don't have to amen that, by the way, but it is actually true. So here's how it works. They just, women, for the most part, because of that sensitivity, they're often more aware when there's a rift or a problem between them and another person. In fact, so sometimes their awareness is hypersensitive and they perceive problems that aren't actually there. You know, like I'm a dad. Like I, I've had so many conversations over the years with my daughters, but they, they just are. They're like, Oh, I think so-and-so is mad at me. You know, there's just this tension in the air. I can kind of feel it. And, and, and just they can be aware of that, and that's, that's a good thing. And so they might be more quick to deal with it. Men, on the other hand, can sometimes be absolutely clueless. Like, there can be a huge problem that everybody else in the room sees, and they're like, what? Like, I, I hurt your feelings? You know, I mean, I didn't even know I did it. You know, it's like, what's going on? I mean, I mean, there's something about the way that we're designed that we need to hear, you know, if, if, if prayer is lacking in power, then, then I need to intentionally stop and say, God, is there anything? Is there something hindering me and you? Because I might not, I'm, I mean, I need to come into your presence and say, if I'm going to be a praying man, then I've got to be a holy man. There's no way to, to, to step towards what real prayer is if I'm not going to deal with my sin. And I as a man, you as men, that needs to be something we take to heart that there's something about that. See, I think about what it tells us as an example in James. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What a great verse. Great verse. He goes on and talks about Elijah being an example of it. The effective, like powerful, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Righteous? Well, in one sense, we get our righteousness through Christ. That there's a place that you and I get to come boldly to God because of Jesus. That's true. But there's a practical righteousness that this also refers to, a holiness. They would say, man, watch a righteous man. A, a man who is righteous, who is dealing with his sin. He's not a perfect man, but if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you. If you deal with your sin passionately, like, God, I don't want there to be a problem between me and you. I, I want to have access. Men need to hear this because it may be one of those areas that is actually shutting it down in our lives. Like, we just don't feel like we're good at praying, partly because we're not good at dealing with sin at times. Men, you need to deal with sin. Like, if you're going to be a man of prayer, if he says here, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, you're going to have to lift up holy hands. It has to be the first thing you deal with. With that, he adds another I desire, therefore, that men 
pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath. Without wrath. Well, what is this? Well, can I be clear and honest with you? There's actually two possibilities into what this refers to. Bible students are fairly split into what is being referenced by this instruction. And honestly, both of them are good. So we're just going to talk about both of them for a moment and let it land where it will. Some would look at this and say the wrath that it's speaking about is having, just having a wrath between us and other people. They'll say the, you know, the idea of holiness is that we have a right vertical relationship with God. And the idea of wrath is that we have good horizontal relationships. That one of the things that can hinder is not only being wrong with God, but if we're wrong with other people, that also hinders us from being the kind of praying people that we're meant to be. Jesus said so. He would give it to us this way in Mark 11. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Jesus says, you're there, you're coming to pray, and then all of a sudden you're aware, like there's a problem between me and somebody else. And, and, and if it's on your side, like you just need to forgive them, then you need to forgive them before you go forward. That's not going to work for you unless you deal with that. In other places, Jesus would say, if you're bringing a gift there and you remember that person has something against you, go and deal with that before you give your gift because you can't really be effective till that's dealt with. This horizontal relationship needs to be dealt with so that you can have this access into God's presence. And again, Jesus said, if you don't forgive them, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Like if you're not going to get right with people, then you can't be right with God. That's, that's as clear as I can say it. You can't be wrong with people and right with God. It's an impossibility. John would say so. If we say we love God and we hate people, he says, you're, you're lying. It can't happen. There's, there's no way to have a good relationship with God and have a bad relationship with people. That has got to be pursued. And where that's lacking, sometimes that's what hinders us from being effective in prayer. Where he's telling us, hey, you've got to fix that so that your prayers can become powerful. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this and in one place where he's speaking, again, to men and husbands, he speaks specifically of, of marriage this way. He would say it in 1 Peter, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, that is your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. That's a fascinating thing, by the way. I mean, he doesn't say that to the wives. I think that's probably somewhat true still, but I just think it's interesting he has to tell the men this. Like, be right with your wife or I'm not going to listen to you. Like, if you don't take care of your wife and you're not going to be a godly man there, you're not going to treat her as an equal and treat her with the grace of life, and then, 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 then this access between you, I, your prayers are, you know, you're kind of put on a, you know, locking down the stream and you're going to be kind of just delegated to lesser access till you get that right. I just want to tell you, that's just fascinating to me. It's troubling. But I can just tell you, honestly, I, I found it to be true. I just, can, I, can I just be honest, like straight out honest? This honestly happened to me. I mean, it's like it's just a number of times. Like I'm going in to pray and I'm trying to pray and it's like heavens are brass. It's like not working. And I know it's like, you're siding with her again. Like, it's just, <laughs> and he's like, well, you're, you're, I'm not going to be able to pray until you go and get this right, you know, and I have to, I have to leave my, my, my study, I have to leave my, go out and like, oh, I'm, you know, I obviously didn't, you know, it's my fault, you know, and, you know, and just, we kind of figure out what's going on, and then, then all of a sudden, it's like I go back into my, in my time of prayer, it's like, it's open, God's like there, it's like, I just have found it to be very, very true, and it's true, not just in marriage, it's true in life, that there are places where that's actually holding us back from being effective. That God says, I'm going to hinder your prayers till you get this right. Hey, men, again, there's just something about who we are that at times we can be disregardive of this, that we can be dismissive of this and be like, hey, they can just do whatever. And it's like, that's what God, you know what? That's why your, your prayers are so ineffective. You want to be a praying man? Get right with people. As much as it depends upon you, you can't fix every situation, but you can fix your side of it. As much as it depends upon you, you be at peace with people. You, you deal with that. You're like, okay, I'm going to do that. And so maybe there is this place, that, again, for us as men, that he's just telling us, hey, you, you want to know why your life isn't as powerful in prayer? Why maybe you think, hey, prayer doesn't work for me? 
because you've got to deal with this. Like, you're going to have to deal with your sin. You're going to have to get right with other people because that will open up the door to prayer. So, I told you that this idea of wrath can have two possibilities. The first is it can have this picture of horizontal relationship, and I th- tell you, hey, that's true. Maybe, maybe that's included in the idea of holiness, though. Maybe holiness would picture that, and I think there's some extent of that. So there's another possibility of what this would refer to, and it would have the idea that it, as we're thinking about being in, in prayer, that we're not going to bring in a work of the flesh, that it's not going to be something that, that flows out of wrath or the wrath of man. That there's a danger that if we're going to be effective in God's presence, it has to be a spiritual work, not a fleshly work. There's this interesting passage in Ezekiel, and it talks about the priesthood and, and, and those who are coming into God's presence. And it says, They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. Now, it's a fun picture. A lot more depth than I have time to go into. But God is saying, if you're going to come and serve me, I'm not interested in your perspiration. I'm not interested in self-effort. I'm not interested in your striving. I don't want anything that is that. God is looking for something that's marked with holiness and, and his work because what we would bring into that equation would only be problematic. James would say it to us this way, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. (laughs) <laughs> like, I'll never do it. Like, our anger, like kicking in, you know, throwing in our flesh and the whole thing, God's like, that is never going to do something good, ever. That is never going to produce what you really want. It can't be that way. I think about a verse we looked at a moment ago there in Corinthians where it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. I and mean, this, this is not a place where our flesh is doing battle. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, or they're not the flesh. They're not of who we are but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. There's a place where this is a spiritual battle, and in a spiritual battle, we need those spiritual weapons and and not this place of kind of putting that in, in our own strength. And I'm just telling you, that's needed for all of us. There's not any of us here this morning that probably don't need that in some way, but men, you probably need it more because he's just telling us. And I just want to put it to you that I think that men tend to go on both sides of this. In fact, maybe it's good just to give it to you in a picture that works in my mind. I think of perhaps one of the most powerful places of prayer that ever took place. It was the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus is going to the cross. There he is, and he invites Peter, James, and John. Hey, would you guys come with me? And he invites them. Would you pray with me for one hour? I just want you to pray with me. Like, this is spiritual work happening here. There's a, there's a war of the ages. The, the, the weight of the cross is in this moment. I'm inviting you to pray with me. Would you pray with me for an hour? You guys know the scene, right? Peter, James, and John, they go in there, and they begin praying with Jesus, and then very quickly they fall asleep. You, know, just, just, you just kind of, kind of picture the scene, right? And Jesus wakes them up like three times. Guys, wake up. Like, wake up. Hey, your, your, your flesh is weak. Your spirit is strong. You need to pray. I mean, like, this is where we need to pray. And they're like, yeah, that's great. You know, and, and so they just keep drifting off. And so you're kind of watching this whole scene. You're like, man, that's just so... And here these people are invited to be with Jesus and pray, and they don't. But then something happens. The soldiers show up. Peter is now fully awake. And if you know the scene, he reaches out and grabs his sword, and he starts swinging. You know, just, he's swinging it at everybody. He ends up taking off one of the servant's ear, which is just a crazy story. Like slices off this servant ear, and Jesus has to put it back on. Like, he puts the ear back on, and he just tells Peter, hey, Peter, don't take up, you know, put down the sword. If you take up this sword, you're going to die with this sword. Like, that's not the way I have this to go. This is not, I don't need your wrath. I don't need your strength. I needed you to pry. I I, I invited you to this. I didn't invite you to that. And yet, I want to tell you, there's a picture here that for men, maybe more than women, we, we fall on both sides of this, that where we're supposed to be praying, we're sleeping. Where we're just we're just missing it. And then all of a sudden we wake up. But instead of moving into prayer, we move into a work of the flesh. Man, we gotta do something. You know, I gotta do we gotta punch somebody or go do something. Because it's like, but I'm glad you're awake to the issue. I'm glad you're aware of the problem. But what you were invited to be as a man of prayer, and the way that you're supposed to be handling the things that you're angry over is is to handle this in an entirely different way and i'm just telling you i think for men 
that there's something here that he's telling us. If you're going to be a man of prayer, you're going to have to learn how to do this without wrath. Like, that's not what God's inviting. You need to be holy. You need to, de- to write with God, write with people, and you need to kind of put away wrath. Then he gives us one more. So three things that men need if they're really going to be a man of prayer. Holiness, putting away wrath, and then notice the other. Let's just read it again, verse 8. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Or the idea, again, without doubting. We'll say it in a positive way, that men need to believe. You gotta, you're going to have to believe that there's a sense that is in this, that we got to do that, and yet again, we can cover it from the negative first. It is to be without doubting. Maybe it's easy just to give it to you this way. In James, when he encourages the access that we have before God, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Boy, if we had time. This verse is so wide open. I mean, it is said in such a way that it should just be so clearly all-inclusive. Like, any of you. Like, does anyone need wisdom? Like, if, this, if you're one that needs wisdom, you should ask God. Because you know what? He gives it. To who? To everybody. His, he, he gives wisdom to anybody that will come to him. I mean, as long as you're coming, he doesn't, rebu- he doesn't rebuke you. He says, if you would do this, this is God. I mean, God is inviting you into this place where you could find what you need in him. I mean, it is amazing. It's absolutely such a wide open invitation. But then he does say this, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. He says, you got you to be there where you're not going to doubt because you can't give in to doubt. Like that's what, If you're going to come in to find what God has for you, you can't give in to that. For let not that man who's doubting suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Doubt hinders us from gaining all that God would have for us. Now, please catch this as clear as I can say it. It's not because God's offended. When God says, hey, if you doubt, I'm not going to give it to you, it's not like God's like, well, you hurt my feelings, so I'm just not going to answer your prayer. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with you. It might be easiest to picture it, like he uses the, the idea of a wave and a ship kind of moving in and out. That's probably not going to work really great for all of us because that's not something we can all imagine, but let's think about something we could. Imagine it like, like a moving truck. Silly illustration, but just give it a try with me. So he says, if you lack wisdom, like take your U-Haul, back it up to God, to the dock where God is, open up the gate and say, God, I need wisdom. <laughs> I, I, I lack, I have great need. You, you just need to come and do that. But he says, then don't doubt because the person who doubts, it's like the person who backs up to the, to the loading dock, waits about 30 seconds and then changes their mind. Ah, never mind. You know, this isn't going to work. You know? and, and then they pull away from the loading dock. And then they go over to somewhere else. It has nothing to do that somehow that God failed. It's like the person, you didn't even wait. Like you came to ask and you gave God like 30 seconds to kind of fill up your, I mean, you should wait, like back it up and, and, and you believe. You just like, okay, God, I'm here. I'm open, I'm needy, and I'm, I'm asking, and I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I believe you're a God who hears me, and I'm not going to allow my doubt, doubt to move me out of the location where you're speaking. Because that's the problem. The problem isn't God. It's me that pulls back from him. It's me that would pull back. He says, doubt moves you away from God responding. There's a place where he's telling us that if we're going to receive from the Lord, it has to be a place where we don't let doubt drive us away. Or again, I'm going to go back to saying it positively. You got to believe. Actively believe. How powerful this is. Jesus has much to say about it in ways that I don't fully understand. But I'm just telling you, it's needed. I think about it this way in in Hebrews. He says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And not to make it too confusing, but the word faith and belief they're essentially almost the same word in the Greek language. They're very, very close, and so don't see them as two different things, but the same thing. So the idea of saying, hey, we have to believe or we have to have faith, it's saying the same thing. If, you're gonna have, if you don't have faith 
you don't believe God, it's impossible for you to please him or walk in the things that he has. You've got to believe that God is. You've got to believe that God is, and then you have to believe that he rewards those who seek him. You've got to believe that you know, backing up that truck will work because God's actually there, and you've got to believe that he actually answers. You've got to be the one that will stay there to hear and, and, and let him work. You've got to be the one that believes. Jesus would say it this way. He said, if, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, Jesus would actually say this same kind of phrase a number of times in his ministry. And they are amazing. I mean, they're one of these places that's it's like, wow, did I just really hear that? I mean, is he really saying what I think? It is, it's more amazing than we probably give it any under, just understanding of. In this specific situation, for you guys who know, Jesus is there at the Mount of Tran- Transfiguration. He'd just gone up. Peter, James, and John, he's now come down. At the bottom of the mount, there's a man who has a son that is oppressed demonic, demonically, and they're just absolutely harassing his son. He's brought him to the disciples, and the disciples are completely unable to deal with it, and they don't know why. And so the man comes to Jesus. He's like, Jesus, can you do anything? Could you do anything for my son? Look at how much trouble he's in. And this is what Jesus says, if you believe. If you believe, all things are possible to the one who believes. I mean, like, you, what you, you want to see God work in this? You're going to have to believe me. You're, you're going to have to believe what I'm, who I am and what I'm saying. That's amazing. Now, the man's response is one of my favorite in all of Scripture. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's not like, a, you know, I'm not 100% either way. God, I do believe or I wouldn't be here, but I know that there's doubts in me. I mean, I'm just telling you, men, if you hear me this morning, if I'm making some sense, that should be one of your prayers at this moment. Like, God, I want to believe you more. God, you, I do believe, but I, I, I need to believe you more. I need to trust you more. I need to seek you more. God, help my unbelief because, God, you're a God who hears. I mean, Jesus just tells us that. In fact, he would say it this way just a little bit later. He says, assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I mean, Jesus is like, he says, here's, there's such power here. You could move a mountain. I mean, whoever, you know, who really believes, who would believe what I'm telling you, you could move mountains. He says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe. Believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Now, there's a ton of stuff that we could talk about. This is not a blank check that would give us anything and everything because prayer is never that. Prayer is never getting our will done. It's always getting God's will done. But there are things that are God's will that we're missing because we're not praying. That's what James tells us. says you don't have because you don't ask. And there's something here where Jesus says, you know, you, if you're going to pray and you're going to pray powerfully, then you're going to have to pray with believing. You're going to have to believe. And there are things that could change. Mountains can move. You, you probably understand it. I probably don't need to develop it. He's not talking physically. I mean, Jesus never actually moved a mountain physically. I mean, not, you know, right you know, in his ministry, like walk over and think, I think that hill would be better over there, you know. I mean, he didn't reorganize, you know, just the landscape that way. He wasn't speaking of geographical problems. But he's talking about problems that in our lives, they feel like a mountain. It's just so big. It's, it seems immovable. And Jesus is like, it can move. We can, we can move things. But you want to see that happen. You want to see mountains move, then you're going to have to pray. And you're going to have to pray with believing. You're going to have to be one who believes and, and, and moves into that. If you want to be a person who is powerful in prayer, there's no way else to get there without being someone who actually believes that God is and God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'm just telling you again, that is needed for everybody. That is, that's, that's, just, that's part of what real prayer looks like. But men, can I just ask it one more time? So why does God specifically highlight this for you? Why, when he's telling men that men should be men of prayer everywhere, does he look and tell you, you're going to have to believe? And again, everybody needs it, but I have this just kind of gut sense that for many men, that's part of the problem. Somehow the way that we're made, we're almost like, 
if I can't touch it, <laughs> if I can't see it, you know, if I can't, you know, if I can't move it myself, I'm not sure I, I mean, somehow we just feel like, it, and, and, and prayer by its nature is meant to be something that's by faith. It's not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We believe what we cannot see. And, and we, we're called into a place that we could not be physically there, and yet we come into this place where it's like, okay, I got to step towards that. And I'm just telling you for men, if you're going to step towards what God's design is for you, then this is where you have to deal with. There must be a place where you look at it and say, okay, I want to be a man of prayer. I got to believe. I got to believe. I need to believe more. I need to trust God more. I need to look to him more. I'm just telling you, it's again, as he gives us these things, these are not without application. Again, they apply to every man, woman, and child in this room, but men, you need this more. Because he says so, I want you to be men of prayer, he says. My aim for your life is that you would be a man who prays. That is God's design for you. And if you're here this morning and that doesn't define you as a man, then something's wrong. And it may be that you feel like you're not very good at it. And it may be that for some of you, again, you've tried praying. And it didn't seem to do what you thought it was going to do. Can I just tell you, men, maybe he's talking very specific and saying, do you have holy hands? Is there sin that could be holding this back? Do you need to deal with anything? Is there wrath that you're looking at your own strength to accomplish something instead of the power of God? Do you believe me? Do you, do you believe? And, and I'm just telling you, you should step towards those things because I believe through this, there's not a man in this room, not a follower of Christ in this room, that this could not be true of you, that he would look and say, that's a man of prayer. That's a man of prayer. There's, there, there's something that should define, that is God's plan for you, guaranteed as men, that part of the, the expression of the body of Christ in this world is that we are meant to be a praying people, and men are meant to be praying men, and I'm calling you to it. I am pleading with you for it. I think about all of that, and I find myself thinking of a story that's found in the book of Acts, in Acts 19. There's this great story there, and it tells us, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. I mean, it's this crazy scene. It's like, great things are happening. I mean, power is happening. People are getting healed. Demons are, are leaving. I mean, amazing things. Well, in that moment, it says that some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, this is really, I mean, to me, this is like such a funny story. I hope that's okay that I find it really funny, but I just need you to think about it with me for a moment. So you have these Jewish exorcists, and the idea is they're not Christians. They're not followers of Jesus. They're outside of that, but they're watching all these incredible things happen, and so they probably watched like Paul, like, you know, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus. And they're like, okay, so you just got to use, like, that's a magic word. Like, that's like the powerful word. And so they decide to try it. And so they go get this demon-possessed guy, and they're like, okay, go out. You know, we exercise you in the name of Jesus. And just in case you're confused, it's the same Jesus that Paul over there is preaching. <laughs> just to make sure we're, we're clear on this. As if somehow it was like magic words that did this. Is somehow it was like some incantation. I mean, that's kind of how they're treating this. And so then it tells us, you know, there are these seven sons of Sceva who do this, and, and the sons of the Jewish priests who did so. And the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know. Who are you? I don't, I don't, I don't even know you. I mean, you don't have anything in this whole thing. And then it just says, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, that's kind of a sad story. I mean, I, don't, I, don't want to, but I just find it incredibly funny. I don't know why. I, I mean, I, I literally just, I mean, like, it's just, it's hilarious to me. It's like, here are these guys who are like, okay, you know, we're just telling you in the name of Jesus. They're like, I don't even know who you are. And then he beats them up. You know, tears off all their clothes, and here are these guys out running. Ah! You know, it is like, you know, what in the world just happened? I mean, it's like, what, what's happening in the midst of this? Well, one of the things that's happening is God is being glorified. It tells us that this became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, which, by the way, is where Timothy would be writing this letter, which is just a little fun tie-in. 
But they're all there dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Like, they're like, Jesus is amazing. I mean, whatever was happening in this moment, God is being glorified, Jesus is being magnified, and so that's where everything's leading, but there's something happening in the midst of this that I want you to think through. See, I go back to what these demons said to these men. They answered and said to him, you know, Jesus I know and Paul I know. Who are you? Can I say it to you in this way? If you're here in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're in the same position that these Jewish exorcists were. Like you have no authority in the whole deal. I mean, you don't even have access. See, Jesus came and he died for our sin. He paid the price on the cross so that we could be saved. And that has incredible ramifications. That's eternal. That's like heaven and hell. But the benefits go further because not only do we get saved, we get access. So we now pray in Jesus' name, meaning the access that we have is through Christ, that because of Jesus, we get to come boldly into God's presence and there get to obtain help and there get to find power. That's available to every Christian. That's what we have. That's who we are. If you're not a Christian, you don't have that. Now, it's weird because most people pray, but I just want to say your prayers are ineffective because you don't have the access we have. You don't have the access. And it's a weird thing to be here in this room and find people that sometimes play the part. Like they think, hey, if I go to church and I read my Bible and I pray, maybe there will be power. Like maybe that would fix my marriage or maybe that would, you know, fix my life. And I just want to tell you, you have the same effectiveness of these seven Jewish exorcists who attempt to do something and they have no right or power to do so. And I'm just telling you, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, you need him. You you desperately need him because without him, you have nothing. You have nothing now. You have nothing in the heavenlies. You have no power that you are subject to this world in ways that I can't even fully explain to you. I'm just telling you, you need Jesus. Because right now, you, if you don't know him, that's what the demons would say to you. Like, I, I know Jesus, because like, we know Jesus. And I know, but I don't even know who you are. But you could be that. So I invite you into a relationship with Jesus if you don't know him. I'm just telling you need that. But can I take it to another place? If you know Jesus, do the demons know you? If you know Jesus... Uh, would, would, would demonic spirits answer this the way, would they say, I know Jesus, and I know them, like, they just, they, they mess things up for us, like, they go, they, they pray, and when they pray, you know, they engage in spiritual war, like Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, and they war against he- the spiritual forces in the heavenly, and they pray, would demons go, yeah, I know them, <laughs> yeah, I, kn- I, I know you, because you, you mess up our intentions. You, there's a war taking place, and you're a f- do they know you? If they don't, they can. If they don't, they should, because you are meant to make a difference in the heavenlies. You are meant to be a person of prayer. You are meant to, to, to make waves for the kingdom of God and meant to be powerful in that in ways that we probably can't even begin to understand. I just want to tell you, I would long that your name would be known. I would long that, you know, the, 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 uh, if a demon were to speak, like, I am afraid of them. I would love it if they would say, like, oh, no, don't, don't let Calvary Roswell get involved in that. Like, those, you know, that's like calling in, like, an elite force over here. And, man, you get those people, and they pray. Like, they just undo things. We just do, somehow we don't want that group of people. I mean, wouldn't it be great if, if that's where we were, if, if, if it's being there? How much more horrible it would be if they were like, oh, pfft, they're pushovers. <laughs> they don't ever pray. They, they don't even pick up their guns. Like, we go to war with them, and they don't even pick up their weapons. It's just really fun to fight that kind of people, because they don't ever even know what they got. I mean, would it be horrible if that were where we are? And I'm just telling you, God has called us to something so much more, and that's true for all of us, but men, it is true for you. You are meant to be men who pray. That is meant to be who you are. So I just take a moment to exhort it. I just take this moment to encourage it and say, my desire is that God would make it so. So that's where we're going to end. You you can close your Bibles. You can take your notebooks. And I'll just come back and sum it up in three words. Real men. Pray. To really be a man. To be a man of God. To be a man the way God meant men to be. You pray. 
If, you, if you're not there, if you don't have a relationship with him, then I want to take, we're going to take a moment and pray. I just want to tell you, this is a great place for that to begin. You have nothing till you can do that. And if you don't know him, you can ask him for that even right now. But for the rest, if you know him, my desire is that you would step towards this. And it's needed for everybody in this room, but I'm just going to one more time speak to the men. Does this define you? Would you look, would somebody say, that's a man of prayer? If it doesn't, it can. It's meant to. It's meant to be an encouragement because that's what God has for us. Whatever's hindering your prayer life, let's deal with it. If it's holiness, if it's wrath, if it's not believing, you deal with those things and step forward and become a man who prays so that heaven would look down and say, that's a people that pray. And those men, they are men of prayer. May God make it so for you and I. Would you quietly talk to the Lord about that? I'll do the same, and we'll close together in worship in just a moment. Quiet moment, you pray, and just wherever the Lord's met you. God, would you look down upon us? Would you make us a people that live according to the blueprint that you've laid for us? Would you make us a people of prayer? Would you make these men, men of prayer? God, whatever is hindering that, whether it's the lie of the enemy that keeps them from even trying, or it's the hindrances that hold them back. Would you give us help now? Would you deal with our sin and give us clean hands? Would you help us to put away wrath and take up the, the spiritual war in a spiritual way? And would you help us to believe you? I just say the words that the man said there at the bottom of the Mount of Transfiguration. Say, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. I want to believe you more. I want to believe you more. I want to trust you more. God, help me to believe more. I want, to, I want to be a part of the life that you have for me to be a part of, and I want it to be there in your presence because I know it can't be found anywhere else. Help, Lord. Make us a people of prayer. Make us men and women of prayer. I ask for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May it be so. May God work it in you. May he work it in me. Let's all stand. We're going to close with a final song. If you need to talk to somebody, hey, we're here. After the service, come up to the front up here. Have several that would be here. would love to pray with you, talk with you. Come on up. We'll just love to be there. But right now, I just want to, we want to close in worship, but I also want to just bless you in God's name. As we do each week from Numbers, just asking that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that the Lord would make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.